pleased to welcome all of you to MEGA's flagship panel event on accelerating sub-Saharan Africa energy access with distributed renewable energy. I'm Ethiopia Safara, MEGA's Vice President and Chief Risk Legal and Sustainability Officer, and I'm, I'm pleased to introduce the panelists for today's session. Uh, we have Her Excellency Ruth Nankabirwa, Minister of Energy and Mineral Development for Uganda, Ricardo Puliti, Pre Vice President for Infrastructure at the World Bank, Emmanuel Nirinkindi, Vice President for Cross-Cutting Solutions at IFC, and Hiroshi Matano, who's the Executive Vice President for MIGA. Um, before we begin our panel, let me first set the stage for affordable activities and deliver jobs. Um, it is important for improved quality of life and gender equity, just to name a few things. Yet, large areas of sub-Saharan Africa remain without access to reliable electricity, and we see a strong correlation with today's most acute challenges of food insecurity, fragility, and inadequate access to health care and education. Achieving universal access to reliable and affordable electricity is not just about electricity, but the potential it creates for the citizens of sub-Saharan Africa. Energy should not be a bottleneck. Instead, it should be an engine of green, resilient, and inclusive development. While significant progress has been made over the last decade, the rate of electrification in sub-Saharan Africa is nowhere near what is, what is needed to achieve uh, the universal access by 2030. At current rates, only eight countries are on track for universal access, and several countries would need to wait nearly 100 years to fully electrify. To achieve SDG 7, the pace of electrification needs to triple. National grids will continue to play an important role in energy access, subject to significant policy reforms. However, to quickly reach rural communities and to provide uh, last mile customers with reliable access in a cost-effective manner, distributed energy solutions such as solar home systems and mini-grids must be rapidly scaled up. This is especially true in countries impacted by fragility, violence, and conflict. The fastest electrifying countries have developed strong enabling environments, encouraged innovation, uh, and crowded in private sector investment. In these countries, private sector-led distributed energy projects have not only accelerated investment in energy access, but have also delivered innovative energy-enabled services for farmers and public facilities, helping reach broader objectives of economic development, food security, and climate resilience. Geospatial modeling reveals that more than a half billion of people would be best served by distributed energy technologies, representing at least 40% of new connections. In, F in the FCV context, decentralized energy solutions are often the only hope for expanding access. Most importantly, the least cost approach to universal access can reduce the total cost of electrification by 68% and accelerate, accelerate timelines. Today, MIGA, together with the World Bank and IFC, is pleased to announce the launch of the new World Bank Group Distributed Access Through Renewable Energy Scale-Up, or DARES, platform. The program's objective is to double the pace of electrification through distributed renewable energy technologies and increase private sector investment by 2026. This can only be done through government ownership of national electrification platforms and close collaboration among donors. The World Bank Group DARES platform focuses on five core areas, mini grids, off-grid solar markets, systems for schools and health facilities, solar ir irrigation and cold chain for farmers, and innovative business models to displace diesel generation and improve access reliability. The program has a strong private sector focus and aims to assist companies to scale up through improved access to technical assistance, financing, and risk mitigation solutions. With this, let us begin today's panel discussion on accelerating distributed energy in sub-Saharan Africa. I'd like to pose the first question to Honorable um, Ruth Nankabirwa, the Ugandan Minister of Energy and Mineral Development. Um, Your Excellency, what is Uganda's vision for expanding energy access and how would you foresee this program being beneficial? Uh, good morning to you all. 
I'm honored to be here this morning and I'm grateful for the invitation. Uganda's journey has been uh, slow but sure. We started by emphasizing generation and uh, we have increased the generation capacity because you cannot talk about uh, access to electricity where you have not generated it. And we allowed the energy mix where we do hydropower, but we also have solar. And you may be aware that Uganda is at the equator where we have sun almost every day. So we are encouraging investment in mini grids. We have regulation to regulate the mini grids, especially to serve power to the islands where we have 83 islands which are habitable. So Uganda has the potential, and we have worked out sites for development, about 700 sites, but we have only uh, done 50, only 50 of them. So the problem of uh, extending the grid to the islands will require technology, will require a lot of investment. That's why we encourage solar. Our installed capacity is 1,378 megawatts. But uh, at peak, we are able to use only 800, 800 megawatts. That means there is power generated which is not distributed. So I invite investment in access, and access has to be access to affordable affordable electricity. I am happy that I'm talking about, I'm, I'm seated between people who have been helping us and I appreciate that the World Bank has been helping us to make sure that we get money. But sometimes this money is not uh, cheap, it's not affordable money. And as you know, that uh, the end user tariff that uh, depends, or the affordability depends on what you have invested in generation and probably transmission. It contrib generation contributes 60% of the tariff. So if the money you invest in solar power plants is very costly, the end user tariff is going to be like 30 US cents. So what will people of the island, what will people of the our communities do, will do, is to resort to cutting down trees, and we all know what that causes. So affordability, I think, has to be enhanced. You may take power at the people, like we have power in Kampala City, but you'll be surprised to see trucks ferrying charcoal into the city, meaning that there is power connected in the city but people cannot afford cooking with power because it is expensive. So what will happen in the villages? So we have worked out the regulations. We have plans to do uh, bulk purchase. We have plans to bundle the contracts so that we can quicken the program. Right now, we are access is at 50% where 19 is on the grid, but 38 is, is on the off-grid. And we have plans to enhance the access up to 80% by 2025, and probably 100% inshallah by 2040. But that can be done if we get access to affordable finances, and if we get investors coming in into the country so that we can do multiple projects at a go. The sites that we have waiting for you people are in thousands, 2,200 sites. We have already identified 700 and we want to work on them. And this is where I think I will call upon support to make sure that we walk the talk that we have been advocating for we really do take power, which is clean, 
which is affordable, which is reliable, so that we can see tangible developments. We have potential in agriculture. We want to do value addition. We have potential in minerals. We want to do value addition in minerals as well. How I wish that we can see solar panels being uh, manufactured in Uganda. Our investment potential has incentives where we can issue land in the islands if you want to establish a, panel, a solar power plant. Government has such incentives. Plus infrastructure like roads and water, those are done by government. So I call upon uh, you who are interested in investing in Uganda that you will find there welcome faces, you will find there stability. The country is very stable. The people are welcoming and we are yearning for stable, reliable and affordable electricity. We have potential for wind. We can do mini grid for wind in northern Uganda, because northern Uganda is very far in Karamoja, there is potential for wind. We can do mini grid for geothermal in the western part in Kasese. We have two sites for geothermal. So we believe in mini grids and we have regulations for mini grids. We have the law, we have the regulations in place. Thank you. Thank you um, maybe we can turn to Ricardo now. Um, and Ricardo, you know, to achieve universal access, it's critical that we crowd in all types of capital. Uh, the World Bank has a long history of working with governments on expanding energy access. It'd be good to hear from you on how you think the bank will leverage its expertise in financing um, to help governments accelerate electricity access, in particular um, in relation to renewable energy technologies. And what do you see the role of international partners being uh, in this exercise? With that, over to you, Ricardo. As your office, uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Thank you very much for the question, and I have to say it's a pleasure to meet with the Honorable Minister. I have to say that the problem is, is quite big. Our calculation and the World Bank is the custodian of the data on uh, access uh, worldwide, including in Africa, of course, uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's a very, very complex challenge. There are around 52% of people in Africa with no access to electricity. But the picture is very different from urban to rural. In reality, in urban area, energy access is around 80%. In rural, it could be as low as 8, 10%, 15% in Somalia, just to make an example. So you see the call today for decentralized renewable energy, I think it's very timely. And I'm very, very pleased that we are all here together. In the last five years, the World Bank uh, has invested or financed projects uh, in, uh, in access for six billion. 2.6 out of six billion were in decentralized renewable energy. And last year, 2022, we financed 800 million only on decentralized renewable energy. That means 13 million people get finally energy. They, they look like impressive numbers, but in the reality they are not, because the scale of the, of the challenge means that there are around 700 million people without access to, to electricity, so there is a lot of work to do. I, I think that launching theirs today is great because I think that working together uh, with IFC, MIGA, working together with other development uh, partners, working together with philanthropies, working together with everybody, governments, of course, will make that we can address, we can accelerate the solution to this problem. And honestly, what I can see nowadays all over the world is that there is a, 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 real, uh, a real concern about energy access as a driver for inequality, as a driver for gender inequality, economic inequality, and all of it. So there is this concern that this is a matter to be addressed, and I'm very, very pleased to see that a lot of actors are getting together. In the particular case of Uganda, 
and thank you again, uh, Honorable Minister. We are working together with the Uganda government on their electricity scale-up program, which is about doubling the um, Uganda access uh, in a few years. We are working together with geospatial analysis, trying to find where this investment should be done, and also working on how to use decentralized renewable energy for all uses, for example, farmers. How can it be used to, for farmers to improve their lives? How can it be used to cool, cool down the, uh, the food that needs to be stored and at the moment cannot be stored? So there is a lot of work to go on, but I have to say that we will be successful as much as we can work all together and as much as we can attract private sector with solutions that are more that are modern innovative but as the honorable minister said also affordable for the end users thank you, thank you ricardo um let's turn to emmanuel i know ifc has been a significant financier in sub-saharan africa uh, it's played a significant role in mobilizing uh private finance um in in sub-saharan africa can you say a few words about the plans you have for scaling up uh, financing uh, for distributed renewable energy um, in, in sub-Saharan Africa as part of this joint initiative? Sure. Thank you, Theopis. Um, um, Theopis, uh, IFC, like uh, me and the World Bank, has been and continues to be uh, focused on uh, energy access uh, in Africa. And just building up on the point that uh, the Honorable Minister from Uganda mentioned, the, the challenge for us all is how we can pick up the pace, uh, accelerate the pace of uh, connecting particularly those who are unserved. And Ricardo gave us some statistics that also the minister repeated. About 50% of the population uh, is not connected through the grid. So that's the particular challenge that we are trying to, 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 to address. But I think here the technology, its time has come. So solar home systems, uh, distributed uh, renewable energy systems, provide us, I think, an opportunity to connect a huge number of people, and the minister mentioned the challenge of the islands of Uganda as a case and example. It also provides us an opportunity to, to provide that, manner, uh, that uh, power in a clean way, so, so a very uh, attractive uh, feature. Now, if we think of the numbers, uh, Ricardo gave us a, a couple of them, we see that the investment needs are huge. About 200 uh, billion is uh, one estimate that has been uh, mentioned. And so at IFC, we think about uh, this uh, space as one where we can crowd in not just international capital, but importantly, domestic capital, which is important for uh, bringing in jobs. So, so that's a, a, a huge opportunity to, to also be um, uh, significant in the local economy. We at the IFC have had some experience. Uh, uh, if we look back to the early 2000s, by 2009, we had a Lighting, global, uh, Lighting uh, Africa program that then expanded into the Lighting Global uh, uh, program. That program uh, was initially aimed at uh, providing solar uh, equipment and has been uh, successful to the tune of about two, two, 290 million people have had access to, to, to lighting appliances, but also has been able to generate about uh, $2.3 billion into this kind of market. So the question is how do we uh, then expand on that. So here I'd like to speak to an experience that we have, which we've been together with MIGA and with the bank, uh, building on, on, on that experience with Lighting Global and building a program that is called Scaling Mini Grids. Uh, this program, uh, we, I'd like to quote an example of where we have in the DRC, where we are working with the government to tender out an opportunity that would then connect about uh, uh, two towns. Those two towns would serve about four million people so a real opportunity for us uh, to, 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 to provide an impact in this space uh, for uh, that the renewables are able to, 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 to bring that impact. I think to the theme of accelerating uh, uh, how we reach out to these uh, people who don't have uh, access, it's very important to consider the power of partnerships. So at IFC, we provide equity and we provide uh, loan and debt financing. It's very important to crowd in other DFIs, Ethiopia, so that's, uh, that's something that we can do so that they provide this capital. But we also need to help to risk these projects and to make them affordable, the point that the Honorable Minister was mentioning. And so bringing in blended finance will require not just uh, government's uh, uh, public financing, but also financing from uh, 
supporters to the governments and uh, donor, donor governments that, 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 that fund these programs. And then, if we have the opportunity to crowd in philanthropic capital, that also brings in the pool of affordable capital that we have to bring to these projects. And so, one example I'd like to quote is a recent uh, um, development with IFC and the Rockefeller Foundation, where they've provided about $150 million that we can leverage to bring another $2 billion into investment. So, uh, crowding in capital, providing local jobs, providing local impact, these uh, are the key. Thank you, thank you, Manuel. Um, Hiroshi, we'll turn to you now. You and I have been, for the past three years, uh, working on a number of, of projects where we've provided um, guarantees um, for mini-grid and off-grid operators um, in, throughout sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Um, maybe you can say a few words, and we've gained a certain amount of expertise in this space. Maybe you can say a few words about our plans to scale up um, private sector financing for uh, distributed uh, renewable energy uh, programs. With that, uh, over to you, Hiroshi. Um, I feel that, thank you. And Minister, again, um, thank you for joining this panel. Um, over the years, um, past two years, I think, um, we had been able to extend um, 84 million um, guarantees to the many grid solutions, but looking to our pipeline, we quite have a strong pipeline for about 400 million across um, the developing economies, including Uganda. The reason that we see the increase, I, I guess, is um, twofold. One, one is the technology um, is, is here. So Emela mentioned about um, the new technologies, especially the solar panels, the wind turbines, has become extremely cheap. Also, um, the technology for connecting um, people uh, using the phone um, has been in a, uh, uh, able. So those are the things that's happening on the ground. We've been trying to deploy mini grids for quite a long time, but at least from a technology point of view, I think there's a solution there. The other a new development that we see is really investors. There's a lot of private sector impact investors that we talked um, over on the past few years but um, there are folks that's willing to in go into the rural countries um, to deploy these kind of new technologies. So that's really encouraging. Also, we see donor um, willing to put some uh, grants into, um, into the mix. So all these trends are coming together now, um, and we see that our, uh, we're seeing that through our um, pipeline. So that, that's really the um, good part of what we think is happening. But as we, dig into these projects, we do th see challenges. One um, is coming up is the regulatory kind of framework of the stability of for the projects. Um, these uh, mini grids or off-grid solutions usually do not have um, PPAs, so there's no fundamental um, um, agreement with the government that can um, frame um, the projects. So that's something that is new compared to the projects that we've been doing through the IPP model in the past. So there's new challenges that we need to address and, uh, where, and that's where on um, this world, uh, one World Bank approach is quite important. So um, to address these challenges, um, working together with the bank, with, the, um, with IOC, and obviously together with the government, it will be a cre extremely um, important element for further deploying um, the mini grids into the field. We do think that um, it is possible, but the coordination, um, the unique kind of value proposition that World Bank Group can bring, I think um, will be an important part of further developing this kind of technology into the necessary areas. Um, I could turn back to you, Ricardo, for a moment um, and ask a question. You know, the World Bank, um, has already scaled up its support for um, energy access, including through distributed renewable energy technologies. Um, but now we want to go even faster, right? So can you share a few thoughts on what will be how we're going to do this differently so that we can actually go faster in this space? Um, with that, back to you. Thank you very much indeed for, for the question. I think that uh, as I was saying at the, um, in my previous intervention, I think we see now uh, more acceptance 
by governments and by all the other public actors of technologies like uh, decentralized renewables energy as a way to solve the issue of lack of access in rural areas. So I think this is an important step forward because in the past, governments would always go to all technologies. They would go to diesel, they would go to HFO, they will go to all kinds of fuels that they knew very well, they know how to manage, and they know the technology. I think that what we have seen in the last probably six, seven, eight years is the willingness to, embr to embrace the new technologies, to understand how they work, and little by little, how to regulate them. Because it's not the same thing to regulate uh, solar and regulate uh, uh, other fu uh, fossil fuels in general. So, and I also see that as solar and wind and other renewables have been embraced, the batteries technology has been embraced as well. And that, of course, creates other problems in terms of regulation. What is the value of storing electricity? What is the price to be paid? So I think that there is an, accept, an understanding of all of this. I think there is also the willingness to work with all the parties, uh, IFC, MIGA, the World Bank, and, uh, and of course, other actors, in order to reach solutions that are strong from a legal and regulatory viewpoint, where the legal and regulatory framework is clear, is predictable, and in that way can, uh, can uh, attract and retain the uh, private sector. So what I think is that the World Bank should continue working with government, sharing with them knowledge, knowledge from other countries, from other regions, from within the same countries sometimes, in order to strengthen models that have been successful and scale them up, really replicate them. I think the strength of a program like, for example, theirs can be, is really in the, capab capacity, in the capability to, to scale it up. I think that's what we have to do. One last question. Oops. Um, and if you could describe and tell us what you think um, you see as the biggest challenge in achieving universal access, and how do you plan to address it? And maybe we can, we can start with you, with you, Your Excellency, what you see as being the biggest challenge uh, when it comes to achieving universal access in Uganda. Thank you very much. Allow me also, uh, first to inform you about, because you talked about uh, countries being willing to take on. Uganda is very willing. We amended our 1999 Electricity Act, and we removed the monopoly of a single buyer model, where UETCL, Uganda Electricity Transmission Company, has been the single buyer of electricity. Now you will be able to generate and sell this electricity to distributors. I think this is going to see us uh, improve the accessibility. We have removed the monopoly. And the demand is, is rising. But like I said, the new technologies that come by, we need to adapt them. We need to sensitize people to adapt the new technologies. We need to help people through, like in Uganda, we have a company called Uganda Energy Credit Capitalization Company, which helps build the capacity of SMSs to be able to package their projects very well so that they are bankable, so that they can access money. This is going to see many small groups that are engaged in businesses out there in the communities to take up the facilities as they come by. So technology transfer, and sometimes capacity building, sometimes the staff may not be enough to be all over, all over the, the, the country where electricity is needed, but slowly by slowly we will be able to uh, improve. We've built capacity. Slowly by slowly, every concession that comes to an end returns to government. So 
government is going to be in the middle of it. We are not going to have middlemen there. Concessions have been coming to an end and we have been reverting. They have been reverting to government. But with new technologies, with adaptation methodologies, we are going to see access. And I'm grateful for the facility which I'm about to get from the World Bank, the Energy uh, Access Scaler project, where I'm going to receive like 400 million US dollars, although I need about 300 million US dollars to take care of the applications that I have every year, every year. We can no longer suppress demand in Uganda. So a challenge is that the demand is there, but we are moving slowly. But with your support, we hope that we will be there. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll turn to you, get your thoughts on what you see as the biggest challenges in achieving universal access. So, um, uh, was, uh, the Honourable Minister mentioned uh, the issue of affordability and um, uh, uh, that, that being key for increasing uptake. So, a key component of affordability is actually uh, the, the, uh, the, the how you finance these projects. And a huge component of them is uh, uh, the, the foreign exchange uh, piece of it. So, it's really critical that we address the issue of local currency uh, and, and, and financing these things with increasing amounts of local currency. What we notice is that lots of, currency, lots of countries don't have access to, to deep pools of uh, local currency. So this is one piece where we can uh, provide support. I mentioned the role, not just of uh, DFIs in bringing blended in finance, uh, the role of uh, development partners and also philanthropic uh, capital to, 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 to bring affordability. But for local currency in particular, we do have an instrument uh, within the World Bank Group, the private sector window, the local currency facility. So if we can increase uh, the, the pools of funding available to this, then that's a significant piece we can bring to lowering the cost of uh, this, this kind of instruments. Well, uh, Hiroshi, your thoughts on uh, the biggest challenge in achieving universal access? Yes, um, thank you. Um, I, I think distributed power is a global trend. So um, we do see um, in the developed countries and also in developing countries that this technology is being deployed. But one of the challenges is really the smallness of the projects. Um, so we do need to improve our processes in, uh, in deploying these um, technologies. Um, our underwriting process, our due diligence process, how we can effectively um, look into the projects and determine whether it is able to be guaranteed or not. So that's, that's really one of the challenges from the operation side that we see. But at the same time, um, some of our donors are small, so we do have a trust fund that will help our, um, our sponsors or investors to um, look into this, um, into the due diligence process. So we want to use our trust fund to um, uh, facilitate um, uh, the process of doing due diligence, looking into the bankability of these projects. So those kind of um, challenges, we do think um, there are, um, we need to address. But at the same time, as the, um, Manuel mentioned, uh, as the minister mentioned, as the caller mentioned, there's a huge potential and need um, in uh, deploying these distributed powers. So um, we, are, we are looking forward to the challenge, but again, um, it will only be possible through our cooperation with the government and through the One World Bank approach. Thank you. And uh, Ricardo, we'll give you the last word on this, on this topic. Yeah, I, if you want, the, the challenge I see is also an opportunity. The challenge I see is a fragmentation of uh, many uh, potential financiers and donors all approaching the same problem in different ways. And that's where theirs comes so well, because it's not only working within the World Bank, but working with others, with uh, philanthropies that are more and more active, with, provide, with donors, with other bilaterals and, and multilaterals. So I think if we are able to make sure that the work is more coordinated, country by country, with governments, regions, by working with the regional association, for example, the West Africa Council come, come, Economic Council come to mind, or other institutions like that, be able to scale up. And it goes actually very much in favor of what Hiroshi was saying. If the fragmentation of help generates fragmentation of project, it will be very slow. 
to, to be able to address the issue of lack of access in rural areas. So working really together, better coordination would help. From a financial viewpoint, I fully agree, there is the matter of due diligence. If we are able to standardize them better, they will cost less and they can be done quicker. Also bundling up. Why we cannot bundle up some projects in order to make it more financeable, cost less and can be done better? And, and from a procurement viewpoint, we can get better deals as well. So you see, there are challenges, but I think that we know them. And if we are able to work together, we can really overcome them. Thank you, Ricardo. My panelists have been very concise and very efficient today. We have time for questions from the audience, which may be a bit of a rarity, but um, why don't we turn to the audience and see if, what, what questions you may have for the panelists here. Um, yes, we'll get you a mic. Hang on a second. Good morning, thank you very much. My name is Vimal Mahendru. I represent an organization called International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, my question to all of you, you mentioned access to technology and technologies can make a difference. What do you see is the role of international consensus standards and what uh, is World Bank doing right now to make sure that it is aware of what the latest technologies are which can be brought into countries like Uganda. Thank you. I start with you on that one yeah, and then turn if to you want, uh, Emmanuel. Then it's a very good question. And the World Bank has always tried to be on top of technologies. Just for you to, or for all of us, not for you obviously, to remember, we were the very first to launch a, a facility about electrochemical batteries. And through these facilities, we've been able to, to put a lot of electrochemical batteries on grid, off grid, in Africa and in other countries. And obviously, what we see as also very important is how we can, uh, we can make sure that batteries, for example, can work very well with solar. Standardization. We are full in support of standards, and we work with several organizations. You realize that standards is not only a legal, juridical concept, it's a technical one, and actually it's conducive to a reduction in cost for technologies. So very much in favor of new technologies. Of course, all technologies that must be, must be cost effective, and always going back to SDG 7, no? Technologies that allow, allows countries to get to secure, affordable, clean, and modern energy. So that's really the, the North Star. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, Marcus, I was going to turn to you anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for this. And, uh... Oh, closer. OK, sorry. Firstly, thank you all very much indeed. So I'm Marcus Williams. I'm actually with MEGA, and I have a question for Your Excellency. Marcus. Speak up? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so the question is um, uh, how, the role of the utility in, uh, in this transition, because I think that depending on how you look at it, um, you know, distributed energy is, can be very complementary to what the utility is trying to do and gives them a chance to focus on, on other, other sort of aspects of their mandate. But it could also be threatening, I think, as well. And so I wondered if you had any thoughts about how to manage that tension domestically. How do you, how do you help the utility find a way to welcome in distributed energy as opposed to uh, perhaps sort of resisting? And maybe this is a question we can ask both to Her Excellency as well as Ricardo. Um, managing the perception of threat uh, to the utility. Um, from a practical standpoint, and, 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 uh, and Ricardo, from your, from your experience yeah. working across the, across the globe. We'll start with you, Ricardo, and then turn to Eric. No, 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 it's fine. I, I think it's a fair question. It's a fair question all over the world. It's not a question uh, for the developing world. It's a question worldwide. The incumbent, no? That's what it's called in reality. The incumbent will always feel threatened by changes. And the incumbent usually have the contacts, the historical contacts with government and local and central government to defend their position. And actually, you see, this is one of the major causes of concern 
the concern is the resistance to new technologies, sometimes driven from not knowing the technology, but sometimes having vested position that are not ready to, to accept the arrival of, uh, of uh, private companies or to, or to have a more, what can I say, a more vivacious power market. I think this is really the work of governments with, uh, if they want, the advice of the World Bank and uh, MIGA and IFC to be able to explain even to the incumbent that they also have to learn to to gain from having new technologies, that uh, having a dominant position is not good in order to provide the, bad, the best product, the most affordable product to governments, public sector, and end users alike. So we have to think like what is best from a fiscal viewpoint, what is best from an end user viewpoint, and, and act on that decis decisively, I would say. Thank you, Ricardo. Your Excellency, how has this played out in Uganda? The, has it played out or is it playing out in terms of the threat the utility feels from these kinds of new technology? Thank you very much. Uganda uh, appreciates that... Uh, Thank you very much. Uganda appreciates the fact that... Uh, science is the savior and we have changed our policies to enhance science and technology right from the lowest level right from schools where we even have different salaries for scientists so when new technologies come up and we also appreciate the relationship that we've have we've been having with the world bank we know the conditions, we know the standards that they set up, and we also appreciate the reality. You cannot stay where you are in this new era of transition. You have to accept that. But we are saying that we have to be appreciated. The challenges that we are faced with must be appreciated so that we are not pushed too hard to leapfrog we have to be nurtured, we have to be understood, we have to appreciate the, the time frames that we set ourselves. But we agree that we are walking a journey which has the same destination, and we have to reach that destination without casualties. So we, Africa and Uganda is not, is not allergic to these new technologies, and we are making sure that in all the sectors, because I'm also in charge of mineral, mineral development, we want to use the minerals, the green minerals, to help the energy sector. So we are not allowing exportation of any processed minerals anymore in Uganda. We want new technology to merge, you know, the mineral sector and the energy sector, and it, it can happen. So we are ready and we are working with you, and we appreciate the innovations and we commit ourselves to that. Thank you. It's appropriate, Your Excellency, that we give you the last word, uh, and that's the perfect note on which to end, uh, end this panel. Uh, let me thank each of the panelists for their contribution today. Uh, thank you very much, and thank all of you for joining us. On behalf of the World Bank Group team, uh, we're very enthusiastic uh, about the potential for universal energy access in Africa and new innovative approaches under development. Um, when we all get together next year at COP28, we hope to present you with successes uh, of this pilot initiative uh, and solutions that will scale up uh, under the DARES program. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>